in terms of creating work for young audiences, it can't have some of the complexities uh, for older audiences. How do you create a work that doesn't talk down to a young audience and yet is a, more available for them? Well, first of all, you always talk up. You always let them reach. And if they don't understand something, they'll ask. But I'll tell you, uh, because you're asking about that, when I decided to do Diary of Anne Frank here, we had lots of talks. I wanted uh, Anne Jackson and Eli Wallach to do it badly. Uh, and we talked about it, even with Kate Reed, who played uh, uh, Mrs. I remember her name. I don't remember the name of the other couple that, that lived with them. They were concerned about the kids, and they wanted to know, how are you, I, going to make sure that there are no four-year-old kids that are brought? And I said, well, because we usually talk about what uh, uh, what the play is about, if they don't know it, in our advertising, and we will say uh, seven up. And they all felt that seven was young. And I said, well, let's try it. I think that a seven-year-old will be able to understand a lot, not everything, and let the parents talk about it afterwards. So. Um, they were not sure this was going to work, and I wasn't sure either, but I felt that we could say seven and up. So when Annie and Eli would come to the theater, they always walked through the lobby, and they always wanted to see a lot of the audience. And one day, early, Anne came up to the office and she said, Susan, we can't do this play this afternoon. There are four-year-olds down there. And I said, well, leave it with me. You'll do the show. So they went. And I didn't know what I was going to do, because I went to the lobby to see, and there were some four-year-olds. So I talked to the parents. And I said, you know, we say seven and up, and even that is young. And I really feel badly about you bringing a four-year-old. I don't know. And the parents said to me, we've talked about it to the children. We told them that they won't understand everything, that it's a sad play, and that they, they're going to be OK. Don't worry. They're not going to talk, and they're not going to cry. And if they do, we'll walk right out. But they assured me, and I felt comfortable that if a parent talked to the child about what it was going to be, that they obviously felt it was all right for them. And some four-year-olds are like two-year-olds, and some four-year-olds are like seven-year-olds. And we did the performance, and they were fine. We can't, uh, the touring and outreach to schools outside Toronto has virtually stopped. Uh, Why? Money, Mike Harris, you name it. How do we go back out to the powers, the banks, the political realms to say, you've got to get YPT, you've got to get Stratford, you've got to get these companies touring back the ballet out there? Because there's, you know, a, a, a student in, in uh, Collingwood prob probably never see classical music, will never see classical dance, will never see classical theater, ever. They no longer come to Stratford because there's not the money for it. And nobody goes north or west or east. How do we do that? Does outreach work in uh, uh, in schools or in uh, theaters or in churches or the th the theaters and companies and dance companies and music companies don't have the money to tour, or if they tour, they tour with one or two people now. The school boards don't have the money to bring buses down but to... But you know, uh, the school boards work with Prologue. And Prologue is sending uh, 60 different performers and performances into schools. 
So I would imagine they eat up a lot of the extra money schools have. I don't know prologue. Prologue to the performing arts. No, I don't know them. Uh, we started the ballet, the opera, yeah. and YPT. Started prologue to the performing arts in 1964. Is this still going? Bigger. Wow. And be better than ever. Because Stratford doesn't move. I mean. Well, no. The, the performances prologue sends out are small. Yeah. YPT doesn't, to my heartbreak, no. tour in schools with prologue either. But I mean, I've talked to touring Shakespeare companies, you know, who to try, and they say, well, basically, we'd be sending one person out now, which becomes a contradiction at a certain point. Right, right. Um, You're talking about sending big companies to... Enough of a company, enough of a dance company, enough of a classical music orchestra, enough of a, a classic theater company, so the student actually get a sense of what's going on, and that's all disappeared let alone outside the richest province uh, of Canada, let alone New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, yeah, PEI. Yeah. I mean, let's not talk about those yeah. places. So it, it has been a collapse um, of, ac of, of taking two young audiences and students, yeah. have them at least exposed to a wider range of culture at least once in their life so they can make a choice. Uh, after we finish our discussion, I will put you together with Prologue to the Performing Arts, if for no other reason than to talk about the performances they send to schools. Right. Because that's a large part of the budget. Right. So uh, outreach, maybe instead of going into schools, uh, may want to get together with other organizations, in uh, whether it's the churches or uh, uh, I just think that uh, it's worthwhile. Prologue definitely, and since I'm one of the founders of Prologue, mm -hmm. has taken a lot of money uh, from the schools to bring performers into schools, but not the large companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be the ballet, the opera, YPT and the symphony. The symphony is always in the schools. They have long before we started. I have to look it up. They are. I have to look it up. They are there. But uh, the ballet, the opera, and YPT started prologue to the performing arts. Let's talk about design for a bit. Um, you brought in designers at mm -hmm. YPT. Mm -hmm. the, the visual element that you present behind a play, what part does that play in the in the piece of theater? Well, it depends on the performances that you do. We did uh, uh, plays uh, at the beginning that were existing plays into the theater. I mean, we did uh, a Diary of Anne Frank, we, but we did existing plays. We at the beginning didn't commission plays. Right. And we did plays that were actually adult plays, but that were uh, attractive for young uh, young children. And so they were very uh, visual because that's how they were written. Uh, of course, the most visual, the one we opened the theater with, uh, The Lost Fairy Tale, which was the Laterna Magica, right. which is probably the most visual you can imagine. But uh, Jan translated it from the check into English. He took the performers to Prague to uh, dub the check into English. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a Laterna Magica. I think I have, yes, yeah. years ago. So it has the black theater with it. I mean, it's probably the most imaginative and geared two children, it was that solid. And with the young audiences now who are so exposed on television and film to spectacular visuals and spectacular visual effects all the time, how, how in the theater then do you address um, not having the resources that, you know, the You can't Pixel compete can throw with at. that, but you are, the TV is competing with the live or a performance, and that has 50% right then and there. I mean, it's live, it's there. You, uh, you could touch them. 
And that has a magic of its own, which TV doesn't have and, and movies don't have. So you can't compete with their visual, but you have a different visual. And I think you have to make sure that uh, uh, the costumes are wonderful, that the props are imaginative. Uh, it depends on, uh, uh, on the play you've commissioned. I, I know that mostly now Alan is doing, and, and uh, uh, I think Maya too, commissioned. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide whether you're going to commission only things that uh, deal with maybe today, or are you going to commission to do things that are more imaginative in it that they are not real. Right. But I think props and costumes and lighting is terribly important so that you suck your audience in. You worked for Family Channel for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so you did have put your toes in the television world. How was that? Well, um, it was an, a, a, enticing to go and front the, the, the uh, CRTC to give you the license. That sort of is, is like fundraising. <laughs> you know, you're there, you present the the what you're going to do and why it's important. And uh, it wasn't too difficult because uh, the CRTC was going to have to give two licenses. One license for uh, uh, the public TV and one license for the pay TV because uh, the pay TV was going to have a lot of Disney. Right. And if you had money, and you wanted Disney, you were going to pay for it. So I, I, I wasn't worried that we weren't going to get the license. And the fun of it at the beginning is to give it a look. Uh, how are you going to design the channel? They still use the logo that we designed. Uh, and what are you going to, what programming are you going to be able to buy? We weren't going to produce anything because there wasn't money to produce. And also we had promised that we would buy so that those that were producing uh, uh, for children were going to make money because we were going to buy it. Right. So we were going to buy 40% from Disney, 40% from Japan, who had the most wonderful and uh, no, 30% from Japan, 10% from Europe, and the rest from Canadians, who weren't doing a lot, but some and very good. So that's what we did. And the, the Disney was the biggest that people understood, oh, Disney, well, we'll buy that. Right. Now, the thing is that you buy everything for four years. So once you have your programming done, it's there for four years. So it, there's nothing to running the channel except the business end of it. So mm -hmm. after a year and a half, I left. Uh, there was nothing to do, do again until four years later, you, you have to go and uh, apply to get a renewal for your channel. So that's interesting and then new programming. But you have to sit around for four years, three and a half or three years doing nothing. And do you ever watch the Family Channel now? No. Why not? Well, I watch PBS a lot. Right. I watch the History Channel a lot, the Discovery Channel, and tennis. And golf. I'm not hearing CBC in here. A little CBC, not no. a lot. Why not? There's only so much time.